The writers and the actors in Hollywood are both on strike for the first time in more than 60 years. Why is this happening? When will it be resolved? And what specifically are the studios and the writers and the actors fighting about? Joining us this episode is Jeff Maurer. Jeff is a former political speech writer, television writer, and writer of a substack, I Might Be Wrong, which you can find at imightberwrong.substack.com. And as a member of the Writers Guild of America, Jeff joins the podcast to give a writer's perspective on why the writers are striking. We talk about the key points of disagreement between writers, actors, and the studios. We talk about the factors that make this fight different from previous fights. And we talk about the general malaise of the entertainment industry and how new technology is affecting it. If you enjoy the podcast, please like, subscribe, leave a comment. All of that helps. And if you want to support us a lot, we would appreciate you becoming a patron at patreon.com slash neoliberal podcast. We would also appreciate any of you who love the podcast and want to become a member of the Center for New Liberalism. You can do that at cnliberalism.org slash become a member. We'd love to have you. And thanks for listening to the episode. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the New Liberal Podcast. I'm your host, Jeremiah Johnson. This podcast is brought to you by the Center for New Liberalism. Check us out at cnliberalism.org. My guest today is Jeff Maurer. Jeff, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. So, Jeff, like we referenced in the intro, today we're talking about the strike And this is no longer just a single strike. This is no longer just the Writers Guild, which you are part of. It is now also the Screen Actors Guild. And actors and writers in the entertainment industry, in Hollywood and everywhere else, are on strike together for the first time since 1960. Mm -hmm. I think this is both a really big deal. It's impacting a lot of people's lives, and it's going to impact our culture if it drags out too long. And it's also just really interesting from a kind of a policy nerd perspective. And I know that you are deeply in kind of both of these worlds. You're obviously someone who writes for television and has been in this world a a while. Uh But you're also somebody who likes to write about policy and is kind of a a political nerd to some extent. And so I want to ask and I want to get into the the serious stuff quick. But first, I just want to say, you know, at the same time, this is impacting your personal life. You actually find yourself analyzing it at the same time and be like, wow, this is really interesting. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Which, of course, you know, is not exactly the orientation you're supposed to have as a guild member. Um, (laughs) You know, when you're in the guild, everything's very black and white. But then, you know, on my blog and in my writing generally, I I try to go into the shades of gray because you're right. Before I was a TV writer, I was I was a speech writer. So I had this political career. I'm old. I had this political career before I had the TV writing career. And um, yeah, so uh, the sort of policy analyst side of me is difficult to turn off. Um, but I do, um, I, I find myself, I, I, I like to think, even looking at things through clear eyes, I feel like the Guild, we, we got some real uh, genuine complaints here and uh, a strong position. All right, so let me ask just as a, as a beginning question, which side are the evil, demonic, <laughs> just uh, awful people and which side are the virtuous heroes that are you know uh, doing everything right and they just want to you know survive and and they are being taken yeah. advantage of i, I, I assume so, it's as clear I am as that i'm so glad you asked we are the courageous rebels we are the downtrodden we are the everyman and they are the mustache twirling villains thank you for asking that question are we done yes that's that's the interview and actually no let, let me do this and i know this is a very difficult position but we, let's do it once because I know we're we're going to get into the other side of this. From the perspective of the studios, what is their argument? And what I'll let you give their argument so that you can then rebut it if you want to because I know you are you have oh, a side in this, but but yeah. if you were if you were to give the side of the studios what they are saying or what they're telling you, what is their argument? And then of course we can get into the Oh, in th- okay, this is an interesting question. Now, the, the writers guild member part of me is telling me tank this. Tank this question. <laughs> 
<laughs> say, make it sound as if they, they have no argument whatsoever. But then the, the part of me that just like likes debate and likes to be contrarian is telling me to do, do a good job. <laughs> See if you can knock this out of the park. Um, so, le- uh, but let me attempt. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try it. I'm going to try to give their argument. Um, and that is the world of TV has changed a lot. Um, streaming has changed things. Everyone agrees on this point. Streaming has changed things, and the writers, again, I am speaking in a voice here, the writers want to keep things the way they were. They kind of want to go back to the uh, old era, the era of 20-person writer rooms and 24-episode sitcom seasons, and that world has just, that just doesn't exist anymore. It's a technological change, so the writer, the, the things that the writers are balking at, the things the writers don't want to accept, are driven by technological change. And they're kind of looking to us to not just freeze in time, but turn back the clock to an era that is bygone. Let me emphasize one more time, I was playing a character there. And I'm not in, I'm not in SAG. I'm a writer, not an actor. So I don't know how convincing it was. But that is, I think, the argument. And so you as a writer, as a member of the Guild, when you hear this argument from the studios, and, and one presumes the studios have, you know, from the outside would have at least some basis for this, What's your rebuttal to that kind of statement about like writers just can't accept that we're, we live in a changed world now? Okay. Okay, good. Yeah. So now I get to rebut myself. All right, here goes. You greedy sack of shit. How dare you talk to me like this? You are a corporate suit. You know nothing about art. You are, you're, you're greedy. You're soulless. You're trying to strangle this industry. I hope you get hit by a train and your corpse catches on fire. That would basically, that would basically be my counter. Let me see though, if I can walk that out a little bit. And make some, <laughs> let me try to make some more substantive arguments. Okay, there joke over. Here, here's, here's the real response. The response is, we know that the world is changing. And all the, the changes that we're asking for are very much in response to that world. We are not asking to, to go back to the 24 sitcom season. We know that era is over. over. We are trying to carve out a living in the new streaming era. And let me say let me say another real thing, because you've, uh, you know, brought up the question of, you know, black versus white, good versus evil. Look, I, I get it. I know what a producer's job is. A producer's job is to bring the thing in for as little money as they can possibly spend. I get that. So honestly, I kind of bristle when I do hear the rhetoric I was just making fun of where it's like, you're evil, you're greedy. It's like, dude, that's the job. The job is to pay us as little as they can get away with. And I I hope people understand, you know, our job as a union is to not just sit and take it. Our job is to not go, okay, well, you know, thanks for hiring me at all. We we need to get ours. We, (laughs) this pie is going to get divided up. We want to make sure that we get our slice of the pie. We do create a lot of value. We're essential. And a lot of the things that we're arguing about residuals, um, you know, how is all this AI stuff going to shake out? This is very much geared towards the new world that we know that we're living in. I mean, one of the biggest questions right now is how do residuals work now that there aren't really reruns anymore? For years, the way it worked was, you know, you write a TV show, but then when the network reruns your TV show, you get some money for that airing. This is why people who wrote for like, you know, Seinfeld or Cheers or whatever, they have more money than God because they just keep re-airing those shows over and over. Um, but for most writers, middle cl- class writers, that was kind of an, a form of unemployment insurance because even when your show went off the air, you'd still get a little something when it got rerun. And that kind of kept you going during the down times. But on a streamer, and can I can I break in? Yeah, please. This this likely also applied to actors as well, right? It, in the the particulars might be a little bit different, but in general, actors yeah. were also getting residuals and, and and things like that, right? Correct, correct. And it's a, it's a it's a big deal. It's a significant. It's not a majority, but it's like a significant part of your income, and it is the consolation prize when your show gets canned, which happens all the time. So yes, for writers and actors, residuals are important. And the question is. How does that work in the streaming era? Because what's a rerun on a streamer? You know, they're not really rerun. They're just always there. What's very interesting to me is that the last time this happened, both actors and writers on strike was 1960. And by the way, you know who the president of SAG was in 1960? I do. It was the guy from Bedtime for Bonzo, Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan, (laughs) pro-union, liberal California 
you know, Hollywood guy. Left wing rabble rouser. It's crazy, but uh, this is <laughs> yeah. this is one of those weird facts of hi- history that you know, if you say it today, it doesn't sound right, and if you said. Uh-huh. You know, in 1960, that Ronald Reagan's going to be elected as a union busting president, it also would sound real weird. But yeah, it's and it, just and in only 20 years, <laughs> only 20 years after that. I know, man. I also think um, my, my logical extension, I think Fran Drescher is going to be president now. I think that's what that means. <laughs> that's the future we deserve. <laughs> but but so back then, the 1960 strike was actually about residuals because they were discovering for the first time you know, television in 1960 is not a brand new thing, but it's still up and coming. Like, it's still like, we're still getting a TV into every household at that point, right? We're not there yet, but everybody can see TV's growing real fast. And executives at some point realized, wait, we have all this intellectual property from movies. We can just put movies on TV and then not have to pay the actors or the writers again. You know, why, why would we produce a new show and pay for new acting and new writing when we can just put an old movie out. And this was a big deal back then because, of course, there's only three channels. Famously, you know, no child born after whatever year will understand this. But, you know, in ye olden days, there were three television channels and they were all black and white. And they actually went off the air. You know, at some point, like at like 10 p.m., they were like, well, television is done for the night, America. Good night. And they just wouldn't broadcast. So what all this means is that there's literally... In a given day, there's maybe like 16 hours of television on a channel and uh, 48 hours total. That's it. That's the total sum of possible programming is 48 hours a day. And so if you put on a couple movies, that goes from 48 to 44 or from 48 to 40. And it's literally less work for actors. And so, of course, actors were not happy about that, that, you know, they would be their industry of be acting would take a 10 percent cut. And so they demanded the right to be paid for residuals, for being broadcast on TV. And it's funny that, you know, 60 years later, we're we're fighting about the same thing, a technological change that has led to a fight about residuals. It, you're completely right that it very much is driven by a technological change and that these disputes are always driven by a technological change. I mean, the last, the last strike in 2007, 2008, it was the beginning of the move to streaming. Before that, it was VHS. Yeah, I'm pretty homes. sure there, there was a 1980 actor strike. I don't know if the writers went on strike, but the actors struck in 1980, we and it was late about eight- home video. Yeah, we were we were late 80s, uh, like 87, and, and sa- but same issues, same issues, because yeah, home video was very much changing the landscape. And and you're right that residuals did come from 1960 from networks airing movies because if you think about it, the logic is sound, right? Because okay, you're a, making television as a writer or an actor, or whatever. You're paid to make programming, right? You're making programming. When they rerun something, whether it's a movie or a TV show that had previously aired, you're making more content. It's just it turned out to be more content than they realized. Because when you got hired for the thing, they didn't know they were going to air it four, five, six. I mean, you know, I referenced Cheers. How many times have those episodes of Cheers been on? I mean, my God, it was on. <laughs> I was born in 1980, so it was Cheers was on three or four times a night, basically from when I was 10 to when I was 20. So you're creating more programming. And that's the same issue here. If you have a show that's on Netflix or Hulu or Apple or whatever, and people like it, and they watch it, and they continue to watch it five years, 10 years after you made it, well, you are continuing to provide content, to provide value for Netflix, Hulu, Apple, however, whoever. So that needs to be accounted for. There needs to be compensation for that. That's a huge part of what this fight is about. Now, one of the things that I've heard is really crucial here is that it's not just the idea of residuals, because at some point the studios, I I think mostly already do pay residuals for, uh, I I, I may be wrong here, but there's there's a formula. But the thing is, it's not open and it's not really, nobody knows precisely how many views you get on streaming services. Netflix famously will not release any numbers. They release like a weird once in a, once a month, they'll release something like Squid Game was watched, you know, by 60% of Japanese people. And you're, and you read the tea leaves to say, is that good or bad? You know, and, and there's, it's 
there's two theories of this, and I'm very, very fascinated by which of these theories is true. One theory says that Netflix does not release the numbers because they're too good. They're big numbers, and they would show that all these shows they've been canceling are actually very popular, yeah. and that they would have to pay a lot of money in residuals if they release the numbers. Theory two is that they don't release them because the numbers are low, and the numbers are bad and embarrassing, and Netflix would be embarrassed if people saw, like, oh, we have this hit show that's getting all this critical acclaim and only you know, like a third of a million people watched it, you know? And I, yeah. I don't know which of those is true, but it, number one, I guess, is is this true for every streaming service? And and do you have like a sense of what's going on there? Every It's true of every one that I'm aware of. Um, I Yeah, there, maybe there's an exception. If there's an exception, I don't know what it is. And the second question, do I know what's going on? No, I don't either. Th- this really is a mystery. It is every bit as mysterious to me as it is to you, and I, if there's somebody out there who knows what's up, other than somebody, you know, deep, deep, deep in the inner circle in Netflix or Hulu or wherever, uh, I don't, I don't know who knows the answer to this. And th- this is one of the things, you know, like I said, I, I don't, I don't think producers are bad people. I think they're doing their job, right? One more time, that's the gig. Bring this production in for as little money as you can possibly spend. I get it. Nonetheless, there are just a couple things in this dispute that do make me think, what are you doing? What are you doing here? And this is one of them. The, the refusal to release the numbers. And I absolutely do not don't know why they do this. I mean, it's, it's baffling to me in a, an industry that has run on numbers as far back as anyone can remember. I mean... Like, people know what Nielsen ratings are. Just, you know, people who don't work in TV, that's just something people know. They know that if you're, if people are watching your show, it's going to continue. If they're not watching it, it's probably not going to continue. The weird thing about the numbers here is that you need to know how many people are watching a thing in order to negotiate your next contract (laughs) and to know if it was a hit or not. You know, if you have a show and then you're in talks to do your next show, you're really completely in the dark if you don't know what the numbers are. And I really honestly am baffled why they don't release these numbers. If they don't want to make them public, well, can can anybody see them? Can our agents see them? I mean, it really is ridiculous to be having these conversations 100% in the dark. It's a, it's a really weird situation. And the bottom line is, no, I, I have no idea why they do it that way. It strikes me that, you know, whenever you're just you're trying to divide up a pie. Most negotiations on some level are dividing up a pie. And if it's just about numbers, if it's just there's a pile of money and we have to fight about who gets what, sometimes that can be bitter a little bit. But those kind of fights get resolved. If it's just, you know, ultimately you will find a a division of the pile of money that begrudgingly everyone is happy with and you, you walk away and, and it gets resolved. But there are some disputes here, like you said, that are kind of beyond just who gets what amount of money. And this thing about like rating secrecy for the streamers, that that strikes me as one of those things that's a, almost a cultural thing at, at Netflix now that they just don't want to give up. And it's, you know, that's it's almost like you can't have an honest conversation about the money unless you know what the numbers are. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's it. And I, I don't know, maybe... Maybe at this point, and we keep saying Netflix, but we should emphasize that I, I think it's all, to my knowledge, it's all of them. Um, maybe they just feel like they've really trenched in. I don't know. I mean. Inertia they're, is they're, a powerful force. Inertia, just they don't, yeah, they've never right. done it, so they don't want to. Yeah, that's right. That's right. They, they must see some advantage to it. Although you'd think, that, you'd think the one that was really knocking it out of the ballpark with the numbers would be the one who would want to publicize them, right? I don't know. One, yeah. one theory I've heard is that it's just it's really more about buzz with the show than actual numbers. So they like they like their shows that I mean, we all know this. There's this type of show like Succession just gets written up in The New York Times over and over and over and over again. <laughs> um, but how many people are actually watch, watching it? That's a different question. Succession, of course, we did have numbers because that actually airs on you know television. You can turn on HBO and watch it. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. That's one of the theories that. <laughs> the shows that get the buzz are not necessarily the shows that get the eyeballs. I don't know if that's true. It's all kind of baffling. There's one more thing that I think fits into this category of 
there's a fight that's happening, but it's not about money. And it's about AI. And frankly, I, I'm not sure how seriously to take this because to my mind, it does not seem like there's any danger in the near future of like AI is going to displace writers. Like, I, I don't know. Like I've seen, they're, they're, it's funny, there are actually AI versions of like somebody made, makes an AI fam, family guy. There's AI SpongeBob. You can go like, <laughs> what? You can watch this on Twitch. It's actually, it's very, very funny, but like in a different way than a regular TV show is funny. It's funny in like that kind of like through the looking glass, like what eldritch abomination am I watching right now? Kind of right. funny. And so I, I'm not sure what to, what to think about the whole idea that like, oh, we're all fighting about what's going to happen with AI. W what's your perspective on this? What is the fight actually about to you? And and is it something you worry about as a writer? Like, will you be displaced one day? I do not worry about it as a writer. It's funny. You, you, there are 10,000 members of the Writers Guild. You are probably speaking to the one who is the least worried about AI because I've seen it. I, I've seen the stuff AI writes. I mean, you're right. Those things are very funny. I've asked AI. So I wrote for John Oliver for a long time. I asked AI in a piece that's it's on my Substack. It's called AI Spells Doom for Incompetent Hacks. I was very curious. What does AI John Oliver sound like? It's not good. It's not good. I, I pasted it in a footnote in that article. You can read it. It's not good. Um, I am not worried about AI displacing my job because my opinion is that AI can't do what we do. I think it's not going to be able to do what we do because AI basically aggregates what's already out there and just sort of cuts and pastes, cuts and pastes and puts it together and makes a new version of the thing that's already out there. That's why the article I wrote is called AI, AI Spells Doom for Incompetent Hacks, because I think, well, that's what a hack does, right? You just sort of uh, download a bunch of stuff that's already out there and then spit out your synthesized version of that. So you're saying that AI will end up writing Young Sheldon. <laughs> you're... Tell you what, Jeremiah, your word's not mine, because one thing I know about television is if you ever, if you ever rip on a show, a movie or anything, you're going to meet the person who makes that thing within 24 hours. It, it's, gonna... a jer it's a jerk move of me to insult what? the show and then be like, ask Jeff to laugh at my <laughs> joke. And now, he, yeah, you're going to have to deal with these people. I'm Sorry, the also, like, the, also yeah. like the person behind that show, they're definitely going to be in a position to give me a job. 24 hours after this airs and they'll be hey i heard you uh shitting on my show on the neoliberal podcast so I'm, sh I'm sure that it's a fine show and look it's it's more popular <laughs> than almost anything else that like all the all the primo shit that we're talking about the succession and the whatever yeah more more americans more real red-blooded americans watch young sheldon i guarantee you wait way way more way more it's it's still uh yes it, any prestige tv doesn't get anything near the eyeballs that a show like Young, Sh Young Sheldon gets. Anyway, but we're not here to talk about the fine, fine program, Young Sheldon. Um, the, uh, yeah, what what AI can do and what it can't. I think the, the thing that it can't do, and as far as I know about the technology, we'll never really be able to do because of the way it works, is the creative part. And especially, you know, I work in comedy Nobody to this day, nobody knows what a joke is. And like people write books about this. Comedians talk about this all the time. What is a joke? Nobody, nobody quite knows. Nobody can write down the algorithm that leads to a joke. I think sense of humor is a good phrase because it is just kind of a sense. It's just kind of something you feel in your bones. I am not worried about AI, but there is an issue here. And I think this is where the the debate really is. Though I should mention, I'm not on the negotiating committee, so you know, I, I don't always know the exact state of every conversation. Um, but this is one of those things that makes me go, what are you doing, guys? Because here's the concern. The concern is the first stage of a movie or TV show is called a commencement, a first draft, basically. That's a stage. The concern is that a network would have AI write a commencement. And I am putting scare quotes around the word commencement there because you'd have AI do it, but it would suck, right? It would be a really, really shitty commencement. And then the concern is they do that and then they bring a writer in to fix this garbage that the AI wrote. And they say, okay, but writer, you're doing a punch up. The reality is, though, the writer's not doing the punch up because all they have is useless words on a page 
And they are, in effect, doing the first draft. But the studio has skipped that stage. They have basically skipped having to pay a writer for a commencement. They've skipped one step and are now going straight to punch up. That's the concern. And we have asked the the AMPTP, that's the association of producers we're negotiating with. We've asked them, just please don't do that, right? Just please don't <laughs> have AI spit out some garbage and then have us come in and fix it. And they've not, they've not been willing to promise to do that. And that's the thing that makes me think, guys what, what, and ladies, what, what are you doing? What, what are you doing here? Can't you agree to that, please? It's very funny that, you know, this is happening in the midst of one of the more successful weekends Hollywood is is having in a long time. Yeah. And, you know, that Barbie and Oppenheimer, two kind of very, very different approaches to movies. You know, one is the the standard, let's get some IP and let's just beat it to death. And, and people, <laughs> apparently, if you have the right IP, people love that. I went and saw Barbie. It was great. I actually thought Barbie was fantastic. Was it? Um. Yeah, it was it was it was funny and good and kind of the right amount of irreverent and winking at itself, you know, and like it's a very this is 2023. We're all meta aware and yeah. self-reflecting in an ironic way. And like it's kind of in that mode. But there's that. And then you've got the other theory of Hollywood, which is we just need more serious directors doing, you know, grand vision, auteur work. <laughs> but apparently that's also working. Apparently, if you do that well. People still want to go see that. And Oppenheimer is doing super, super well. And, you know, what could what could Hollywood do that would possibly mess this up? <laughs> oh. Yeah, they could do this. They, they could make it so that there are no movies after that. Yeah, they could do that. And they miss an entire season. That could happen. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad to hear that you enjoy them. I, I've seen neither. I will see both eventually. Um, I've heard I've heard that Barbie is uh, it doesn't take itself seriously. And I heard that and thought, yeah, I'm in the market for that. Um. But I, I, I think the may, possibly the common thread that connects them, and again, I've seen neither one. Maybe they're just both good. I think too often Hollywood thinks in categories, and they should just think according to good or bad. Um, maybe they're, maybe people are enjoying these movies because they're good. If I was to say something unkind about the producers, which I know you would never do. I would be, as I a, would be irate if you did that. But I, I do think that, you know, and, and I'm not in the industry, but my impression from talking to people is that Producers are very, very trend driven. And once one thing becomes a thing, superhero movies, multiverses, Absolutely. you know, uh, action in, in the 80s and 90s, action flicks featuring a guy with, you know, his shirt sleeves ripped off. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like what? once there's a thing that's successful, all they know how to do is replicate, replicate, replicate oh until the trend is beaten to death. And then oh hopefully God. at some point a new trend will emerge, then you can beat that one to death. Jeremiah, when, when, you're, when you're in it, it just it makes you want to throw yourself out of a window on a daily basis. Seven, eight years ago, it was vampires, because like Twilight and, and like Walking Dead was big. Like vampires. Oh, zombies. Vampires. Yeah. People like vampires. And There's then, a zombies <laughs> trend. Yeah. Yeah, too. zombie. Right. Recent, and then re, a little while, Rick and Morty, you know, was like, that got a lot of buzz. It was a good show and people liked it. And then they went, space, it's space. Space is the thing people want. It, it <laughs> if that's what they if you want to get my Rick real and complaints Morty, about producers, like I said, I understand that the gig is to try to pay us as little as possible. I get that part. The part where your brain is just going vampires, no space, no no dolls, dolls, brats, movie, fast track it. That's the part that drives me nuts. <laughs> if I am being charitable to the producers, I would say it's probably an awful job to kind of sit there and be like, look, there are. A hundred thousand people who've all written the manuscript that will change the world, and right. every one of them insists that I have to read it and like just give this one a chance. Yeah, and I want to throw all of you out of a window because all of your <laughs> manuscripts suck. You're all terrible. I, I understand how it would be easy to just be like, "What's popular? Robots. Let's do another robot movie." Yeah, just pick a random script out of the pile and change the main character's name to Optimus Prime. And like that's that's what we'll do. You know, I don't yeah. know. But I, I mean, I, you're right. It's a it's a it's a difficult job. You're also right that writers are a huge pain in the ass. Every single one of us is a generational talent, right? At least according to us. Uh, but it's 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 one of those things like picking stocks or predicting the weather that the ecosystem is just so big that nobody can wrap their heads around it, and therefore nobody can make accurate, fully accurate predictions. Right? Nobody knows what's going to hit and what's not. And given that reality, I do think that producers sometimes uh, yeah, default to really simple 
heuristics. You know, vampires, vampires are what people like. It's I, I agree that it's a very I, this is what I usually <laughs> say to people who are young writers and they're going to have to deal with producers. It's a very hard job. Being a producer is a very hard job. Nonetheless, many producers are doing it very badly. It's a hard job that people are doing badly is my take. Not always. So I have a theory that I want to share with you. But before I, you know, be like, well, I have solved this. My theory explains everything. OK, <laughs> I want to I want to get your take on the question first, because okay. I already have an answer. But let's let you answer it first, because you may actually know more than I do. OK, um, and, and if I give the answer that is the answer you have in your head, then that will validate it and mean your theory is 100 percent correct. Right? I, I'll be so happy. I'll be so happy. OK, Jeff. so this fight to me seems like it is more bitter and it's going to last longer than these fights normally do, than these disputes normally do. It, it involves both of the major, you know, uh, guilds, the, the actors and the writers. And, you know, people seem to be digging in. You know, people are speculating this could last until the end of the year. This could last into 2024. Like, who knows? Both sides are very committed to not backing down. And my question is, why? What makes it that this time it's as bitter as it is right now? What's different about right now? Well, first, let me say that I think that you're right in that I think that it is different, but I don't know. Because the last strike was 2007, 2008. I wasn't a TV writer back then. I was a speech writer. I was in politics. So I, I don't know for sure, but I agree. The sense that I get from everyone I know who's been through the two strikes, and I actually, there's one person who piped up at a meeting, he's been through three strikes, is that it is more bitter this time. I do try to take some of the rhetoric about, you know, this is going to last till Christmas. This is going to last into 2024 with a grain of salt, because, of course, that is your strongest negotiating position to put up a big on both sides, on both sides, to just put up a big front and say, I don't give an F. This can last until 2030 for all I care. I'm good. They need to come to the table. That's always your strongest negotiating position. So I take it with a grain of salt. But <laughs> I also think there's some truth to it. I do think people are really dug in. I do think this is likely to last a while. Why? I'm going to throw out a theory why it's more bitter. I I'd say two factors. Number one, the technology we're dealing with is more nebulous than before. I do know that in 2007, 2008, everybody saw things going the digital direction. YouTube was a thing at that point. Netflix was making the transition from being a service that mails you a DVD, which is, it sounds like the Pony Express now. They would mail a DVD to your house. But yeah, but they were making the transition to being streaming. Everyone kind of knew what that landscape looked like. Now, I don't think many people really have a sense of what broadcast television is going to look like five, 10 years from now. We all know that things are trending in the direction of streaming but we don't know wh where that leaves broadcast, if it's going to be a thing that s stays around and is just sort of in a little bit of a different lane than streaming as TV and movies ended up being. Because remember this, if you go way, way back, people thought, oh man, when everyone has a TV, then there's no nobody's going to go see a movie anymore. But it didn't work out that way. TV had its own lane. Movies had their own lane. We don't know how it's going to shake out, and we don't know how the, all the AI stuff is going to sh shake out. As I said, I am not worried about AI, but other people are, and certainly we need to know, you know what the rules are about how you can use it. And so I think the technology is more speculative. That is one thing that is making things more contentious. And then the second thing I would say is make it, really making people dig in. And, and this is, I'm kind of, you know, I'm talking out my ass here because I don't have any polling on this, but I think... This has become a little bit of the uh, uh, kind of a battleground in the larger artists versus tech companies war. Have you noticed that a lot of people don't like tech companies, Jeremiah? You know, it's it's funny you say that because I think there's <laughs> there's a political backlash on like very politically online people, both on the left and the right. The right is mad that uh you know Donald Trump got kicked off of social media and they can't say the n word or whatever right. and the left is mad that like they don't do enough to kick off people who say the n word and you know big like there's this just theory of like everything big is bad but i think that like most people just like amazon and google in general like they they enjoy the services 
So I, I don't know yeah. if I'm, I'm a little bit of a skeptic on the tech. I think that's like mostly a politics poisoned thing, but I don't know. Well, I, I take your point, but you agree that there are people out there who really don't like big tech, right? Sure. Yeah, for sure. There's there's yeah. a growing contingent, you might say. Yeah. And you are also right that it's it's a right wing and a left wing thing at this point. But those people exist. And a lot of these streamers are now owned by tech companies. I mean, it is a little weird that you have Apple, for example, being one of the major players in the streaming game. Amazon, too. These aren't entertainment companies first. These are companies that make other things. And then entertainment is just one division basically. And I know that a lot of the um, the people who have been around a lot longer than I have, and people who are, you know, <laughs> more well-steeped in the industry, which is to say a lot more successful than I am, say that some of these companies coming in, they kind of don't know how the game is played, and they kind of just approach things very differently. And I think that has kind of raised the temperature and made it more heated than in previous rounds. Interesting. Neither one of those was was my answer, but okay, I, well, I I think there's truth in at least you know I don't know if it's the absolute truth, but there's like a nugget of wisdom in in what you're saying there, and that's that may know, be generous even. But, I mean, but thank you. Yeah. <laughs> that's What's kind of doing? how I try to judge ideas, right? It's not is it the truth, the absolute truth, and nothing but the truth. It's like can I get a nugget of truth out of it? Is there some wise part of that that I can? You yeah. Know, does it? Does it sound like total horse shit or is there something in there that makes you think, no, maybe there's maybe something there. <laughs> but so uh, let me throw my theory at you. Okay. And and my theory portends a, a kind of a poor end to this, unfortunately, for the writers and the oh, actors, no. really for everyone. But when you had this strike in 1960 and the writers and the actors were on strike at the same time and, and Robert Reagan, or, sorry, not Robert Reagan, Ronald Reagan had this <laughs> beautiful line about um like we're just negotiating for the right to negotiate which is kind of where you find yourself right now god that guy could communicate i you know. know as a speech good, writer good just, with words you know, until you know, until the end be there yeah but um the, the the really the defining macro feature of the entertainment industry at that time is how fast it was growing and you know it, it, it Hey, zoom out from the micro level stuff of we want residual on this show and like television was booming and would continue to boom for decades. And, you know, that we're in a golden age of movies at that time. And if you look at like the 1980 writers strike when they were striking about um, the home video, uh, uh, 1980 was an actor strike. I think the writers strike over home video was in the, like you said, mid to late 80s. But again, entertainment was booming. Home video was becoming really huge. Cable television was expanding and becoming this national yes. force. And movies, again, were still booming. The global box office kept going up and up and up. And today, we live in a very different macro environment. And like, get rid of all the arguments about who's getting what residual and what is AI doing. And just look at what are television ratings doing for the last 20 years. And they're just on a straight line downwards. And, and it seems like they're, they're never really coming back. They, they will decline. They've declined va basically every year that I've been alive almost or since I graduated from high school, maybe not since I've been alive. I'm, I'm old now, but television ratings just keep declining. And the box office for movies was, was doing pretty well through the Marvel era, but obviously COVID killed it. And since we've, since COVID, you know, even 2022, when it's kind of post COVID, you know, there's still... 25, 30% cut to both the domestic and the global box office. And I'm, I'm not sure that it's coming back. You know, that we're, yeah. we're, you know, in 2022, it was something like 30% below 2019 levels. And this year will probably be better than 2022, but it's not going to hit 2019. And, and again, I don't know that it will again. And that's my picture is, you know, when you're fighting over how to divide a growing pie, it's it's relatively easy to make a deal that leaves everybody somewhat happy. When you're fighting over a shrinking pie, then things are going to get really bitter, really fast. And you know what what we haven't talked about here is that streaming exists and streaming is a new source of revenue. Yeah. But streaming does not make up for a 30% loss at the global box office and and what's happening with television ratings. And you know, most of other than Netflix and Hulu, I think most streaming services are not actually profitable. And so, and again, maybe that's Hollywood accounting, maybe it's not, but 
I think that's the big story is that there is this kind of decline in entertainment revenue just globally and and the industry kind of has to face that. And I, I don't know who's going to get stuck with the loss, whether it's the producers or the writers and the actors or both. But yeah. like that, that to me says this is not necessarily going to have a happy end. Yeah, well, I, I think you're right that the anxiety does heighten the stakes. Um, it, yeah, when you're fighting to get by, yeah, when it's not like, oh, you know, am I going to buy the uh, 30-foot yacht or the 20-foot yacht? But it's more like, is this a viable career for me? Yes, that raises the stakes. And yes, that is very much the situation we're in. I mean, I'm... So I... <laughs> I'm kind of a writer who exists in this world that like is crumbling all around me because first I was a late night writer. If you talk about like areas of television where you look at the future and go, boy, I don't know if there's a future there. Late night television. It's just sort of collapsed because people don't watch live TV as much anymore. And there's not really as much of a space for that type of thing on a streamer. And then ordinarily you write for late night for a while and then you try your hand at movies they don't make comedy movies anymore. <laughs> Some people have noticed this. This is another thing I wrote about on my blog. They don't really make comedy movies anymore. There are a lot of reasons for that. One of them is that you have to, movies have to do well in foreign markets now, especially China. And uh, it's difficult for comedy to translate to a foreign mar market. And then also the Chinese Communist Party, which has to screen your movie before it can be played in China. Not famously a funny group of people. So that is to say, I hear you when you're talking about changing landscapes and the strange places it can put writers and actors in and how that can increase anxiety. Can I give you um can I give you one stat that'll just back you up Please, for a yeah. second? So twenty eighteen, uh as far as movies go, nine hundred and ninety three movies released in twenty eighteen. Okay. Nine hundred and ten in twenty nineteen. Now in twenty twenty, obviously, some things were going on in twenty twenty. So there are only four hundred yeah. Only 450 movies were released, and most of them, like, direct to whatever. But even in 2022, only 496 movies were released. Are, are just literally the amount of movies getting produced and released by American companies is, is way down in 2022. You know, three, almost two, three full years after the, the height of the pandemic. Like, and, you know, the, I, I looked up the... The global box office, or sorry, the domestic box office was like 11.3 billion in 2019. 2022 was 7.3. And so just, you know, I think that a lot of this has to do with like, tech, again, I think it's technology, but I think the silent thing that's happening here, where's all that money going? You know, if, yeah. if people aren't spending money at the movies and they're not spending their time watching television and then streaming doesn't really make up for it, where is it going? I think you have to look at yeah. YouTube. Well, YouTube and TikTok and yeah. and uh, Twitch streams and like, you know, a lot of the money that is no longer going to, to writers and actors is going to be going to like Mr. Beast and, and people like that, yeah. you know, YouTube stars. Yeah. And that's very relevant to my field, to comedy. People are asking where, yeah, where are the comedy eyeballs going? They're largely going to TikTok uh, and YouTube, which I mean... God, I'm really going to sound like an old man here, but my God, I, I don't see it. I have, <laughs> I have gotten on TikTok. I've now done this twice. I've thought, I've told myself, this is what young people are watching. Let me get on TikTok and just see what they're watching and go, go into it with an open mind and uh, see what's valuable there. Try to enjoy it. And both times I have come away with the feeling like, this just fucking sucks. This <laughs> is garbage. I don't know. Maybe I'm seeing the wrong accounts. I'm sure there's good stuff on there somewhere. One thing I'll say there is I think it takes a little bit of time. Like TikTok's algorithm is actually pretty good. And so like it's not the traditional thing, you know, where you follow people and you see all their TikToks. It's more like they watch how, you know, how many times do you watch a particular TikTok or how long before you swipe or whatever. And they can kind of glean what you like. Yeah. It, it does take like an hour or two for them to really learn like what you want. And until well, then, you're going to be getting like the mass market, like worst quality stuff. So I don't know if that's part of it. That that truly does make me feel a little better 
because maybe I just needed to stick with it because I did not make it to two hours. Certainly, I don't think I made it one hour. And also, you know, I was approaching it with uh, sort of uh, an anthropological perspective where I was just, you know, observing what other people observe, not watching something because I thought it you're was you're watching funny. all the worst shit yes. into the end. You're probably watching it a second time to complain about how bad it is. And then the algorithm uh-huh. says, man, he, he watched it like loop three times. Yeah. Feed him more of this. Feed him more garbage. So that, that actually, that does honestly make me feel better. Maybe that was the problem. Let me say that I, I don't 100% know that it's true that the total total amount of dollar dollars or foreign currencies going to entertainment is less. I, I, that may or may not be true. I don't think anyone has that precise stat. But certainly what's true is that a, a hell of a lot more of it is going to streaming. In percentage terms, right, the streaming share of the pie is growing and all the other slices of the pie are shrinking. And that's why this dispute is happening now. And that's why these issues are so contentious. Like I said, if you let the AMPTP take the whole slice of the pie, they'll do it. And one last time, I don't really totally blame them for that. I get it. That's the gig. But that's why we have to strike, unfortunately. That's why we have to stick up for ourselves because they will take the whole slice if you let them, and we're trying not to let them. Yeah, I mean, I think that's fair. And I I look at this, and I think this is like a... This has really interesting parallels to what happened to the written content industry. You know, because you, despite the fact that you are a writer, you are really in the visual uh, video content industry, whether that's television or movies or whatever. Um, And you obviously have your, your newsletter, which is very good. But your day job is in the video industry. But the written industry, you know, went through this revolution of there's now more content than ever, but nobody can get paid for it. And or, or if you're getting paid for it, it's through this new model of social media and like weird stuff is going on with blogs. And, you know, the, the, the number of newspaper writers across the country plummeted and everybody knows what the journalism is a field that you can't make any money in anymore. I'm wondering if there's like parallels between that collapse of like written journalism and a potential collapse of like television video content. Uh, God, I hope not, um, <laughs> because that is uh, a frightening future for a writer to contemplate. I don't think so, because I do think I do think there's a big difference here, and that is the cost of bringing the thing to fruition. And that is to say, you can write a blog and just hit publish and your costs are virtually zero. You know, the software, it's a computer, which everyone has. And, you know, Substack, you pay a very small cut to them. You can just publish it. And it's that's been true for a long time. That's been true since like Blogspot was all the rage. To make a TV show or a movie, my God, it's expensive. Just the, the everything costs money. The, you know, the costumes, the sets. One of the first things I learned when I started writing scripted stuff was like, it matters how many sets you have. Because if you say, all right, they're in the office and they walk into the hallway, somebody in production goes, oh God, now we got to build a hallway. Lights, makeup, hair, wardrobe. And then of course the actors and and the writers and everybody, it's an enormous production. So once you're investing that level of money, don't you want the writing to be good? Don't you want your script to be worthy of that level of investment? That's what I would argue. And I think the the smarter the smarter producers get this. And I think the smarter producers also understand that we are in this together. We are collaborators on this project. And if they want not just this project but the one after that and the one after that to do well, they need to make this a viable field for us and help us grow. And to make sure that the scenario you just described, where it becomes journalism and you have, you know, some 23-year-old just writing some garbage and publishing it, that needs to not be our future. And I think the smarter producers know that. And at the end of the day, that will bring us to a solution that makes everyone go, okay, this is viable. I can, this works for me. I can do this. I mean, that that makes sense to me. And Look, without me taking a side here, because I am not you, we have one, you know, rabid partisan on one side <laughs> of the conversation. I'll I'll remain theoretically neutral. Okay. But I do think that at the very least, something like 
the streamer's refusal to provide hard numbers about like how many people are actually streaming each show, you can't have an honest conversation without that. That just seems like a, a clear win for it. It should be a win for the writers and the actors that like you, you can't even get to the point of let's have an honest division of the pie without yeah. just revealing what the pie is. So, you know, I certainly hope that you get that. And I hope that for everybody's sake, it doesn't last too long for the writers, the producers, all the, you know, the hair and makeup people who are going to be yeah. impacted by this, the, the poor consumers who are going to have to watch really garbage reality television. <laughs> and that's it. Let, will someone think of the consumers, please? That, that, that you know? is, um, sort of the ace in the hole for writers and scripted content. When viewers are forced to watch, yeah, garbagey reality shows. And look, I enjoy a good garbage reality show, but that's a side dish, right? It's not the main meal. When it's the only thing on TV, that is the type of thing that will cause people to say, hey, wh what's going on? Can you settle this, please? And I also want to add, as much as I want to say, as, as much as I want to strike the position that I know I should strike and say, I don't, I don't care how long this lasts. I'll, I'll last forever. I don't want to strike forever. I am very aware of all the people who work on a show, you know, the script people, I, I can't even list them all because there are so many. It's such a huge production. And I know that they're not working when we're not working. And I'm not happy about that. So I do want it to end because I want the writers, the actors, and everyone involved in production to work. That is the goal. Yeah. And that's like you said, there's there's so many people, the the mic operators, the camera people, the set designer, yeah. the best boys. I don't know what a best boy is, but I know that oh, they're the best. movies. They're the movies best. They're not all boys these the, days, though. Movies have something called the best boy. And I, the thing is, I don't even want to know what it is. But I know <laughs> that it pops up when I stick around to watch the after, after credit scene at a Marvel movie. And I'm uh -huh. watching all the things scroll by. I see best boy number one, best boy number two. And I just have this vision in my head that it's just somebody <laughs> sitting around who occasionally gets patted on the head. Yeah. And they are the best boy. You do. Uh, it does make you picture two things. Number one, that it's literally a boy, but like a like a Dennis the Menace kid in like overalls with a frog in his pocket, right? And <laughs> but then he's also got like a blue ribbon pinned to his overalls because he's the best. He's number one. I'll be honest with you, Jeremiah. I don't actually know what a best boy does. I don't think I've ever worked on a show that had somebody with the title best boy. I think it's a production assistant of sorts, but I, I I've never actually encountered one. Well, like I said, I have no intention of actually learning what they do. It's better as a mystery. <laughs> We're coming up on time soon now. So let's close the way we always close on this podcast. And that is by asking what we can do if people are interested and they want to learn more. If they want to read more about this or learn more about this, is there anything you'd recommend? Is there a good YouTube explainer? Is there somebody to follow on Twitter? Is there a blog? Um, is, is there anything that you would recommend if people are just interested in what's going on in Hollywood right now. Well, let me recommend something for people to not do. And that is not read, I would say, industry publications, which is like Deadline, Hollywood Reporter, Variety. The, just the, the people who write those so frequently just are not really neutral arbiters. Just by virtue of the position they hold, they are kind of not neutral. I would really hew much more closely to the outlets that, you know, don't have, don't really have a dog in the fight. So New York Times, Economist, Washington Post. I mean, I'm, I'm glad I can tip your readers to uh, not well-known publications like the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Economist. But um, I really think those reporters have less of a connection to this, so they are more likely to just give you the 30,000-foot view of what's going on. And of course, if you want really good commentary, you should definitely read I Might Be Wrong, which is Jeff Substack. So I should have that, said that. Th that has the best commentary on the strike that you will ever see. Right. The only, you know, I should have said when you asked me, what's the only honest source on the internet? I should have said I might be wrong. .com. It's me. It's me. Listen, listen to me and only me on all issues. I am the I am literally the only source of news you need. That's my position. <laughs>
well, that doesn't sound right, but you are the only source <laughs> of news, so I must, I, I have to trust you. So that's you know. right. All right. Well, I, I like I said, I hope this wraps up soon. I hope everybody gets to go to work and has fat paychecks, and everyone's happy forever. I want to thank you for coming on the show, everyone. Jeff Maurer. Thank you very much for having me.